Welcome back to the Public Square Squared Symposium. I hope everyone ate well. Um, this morning, we looked at a lot of massive movements that use massive platforms, mostly corporate platforms like Facebook and Twitter. But there is also another way of organizing social movements and social activism through smaller communities that are very focused on particular objectives that have done a lot of grassroots organizing over the years rather than these more spontaneous movements. And we're going to hear from some of those projects that were the winners of this year's pre-Ars Electronica in the digital communities category. Um, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this panel, Beatrice Achaleke, who is a founder of many different communities. She was also on the jury of this year's Pre-Ars Electronica, and so she's very well acquainted with all of these projects and can speak to us about what it's like, what, how much energy it takes to organize these types of projects with small communities with very concrete objectives. So please welcome Beatrice. Hello, yes, this works. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, very interesting discussion session of the Ars Electronica 2011. Uh, I'm very honored to be sitting here with a, a distinguished guest uh, coming f uh, who are going to be presenting very interesting projects for you, uh, to you um, from different parts of the world. They, all these projects are about digital community, and I think um, as a member of the jury of this category, I must say that we had a very tough time. We had a very tough time selecting projects that were submitted. We, have, we had very interesting projects coming in from different areas, from, from, from South America, through Africa, Europe, and, uh, and, 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 and Asia. And we were a, a, a jury of, uh, of um, five, were we five or six? Um, it's a long way. Uh, from now. Uh, but, but I think we, we, we had to look into this project and then to find out, compare each one of them to find the innovative aspect of what each one of those projects and find out what makes this project stand out amongst all the projects that were submitted. And just like I say, we had three projects that were selected, one for the Golden Nika and the two others for distinctions. And uh, this discussion were very um, uh, interesting for us because it led some of us who work in communities who do not yet know which kind of tools are existing. And of course, we know that um, the social network has revolutionized the movement when it comes to the question of organizing, mobilizing, participating in terms of cost and also in terms of reaching out to the people that we want to, to, to reach. I think the social media has been very, very uh, supportive in this case. And they're talking about digital community and looking at some of those projects that are working in different parts of the world, especially also the, the tools that are being developed to facilitate work in this area for communities has been very, very important in the selection criteria of the project that um, got the prize that we are, uh, the, the project that were uh, um, awarded with the with the uh, with the uh, Ars Electronica Prize 2011. Well, coming back, it's not about me. It's about the project that are here, and I think they are so fascinating that you will rather want to hear from them than hearing from me. Uh, I have uh, Felipe Heiser from from Chile on my on my left hand side. I have uh, Alexandra, and I have um, have to look at the name again. And Cliff, sorry, and Cliff sitting here. I know this project, but I'm just getting to know people who are behind the project. And Tim is sitting over there, and we'll be talking about one of the innovative projects. I think to start, I just wanted to say that I will want to have each one of you present them yourselves. I think there are certain things about you that people would like to know, which I would like to know, which are not in the program. And if you just will take one minute to say a few words about who you are, what are your project, and maybe the, 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 the main goal of your project. I know the in the presentations, you will all have 10 minutes to go deeper into the topic. And for our audience, we have agreed that each, we will have these three presentations done, and after the presentations, we will then have the floor open for questions from the audience. So um, just not to waste our time, we've got about one hour to go. I would like to have Felipe begin with a short introduction. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much. 
My name is Felipe Hoiser. I come from Chile. Um, I lead an NGO called Ciudadan Inteligente, which in English would be something like smart citizen. Um, my background is I'm a, I used to be a lawyer, um, but it's more about public policy right now and political science, uh, but applied in, in real things and real stuff. And I have a huge fascination about technology and how it can you know, uh, be a, play a very great role in terms of, of, of public policy. Um, I'm now uh, joining the Berkman Center as well for Internet and Society at, at, at Harvard University. But above all, I'm, I'm the father of three great children um, and, and a husband as well. So that's, that's, that's me. And I'm going to share with you the, the project in just a, a couple of minutes up, upstage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cliff Hammett. I'm from uh, London in the UK, and I'm engaged in the, in the field of um, kind of critical media experimentation. So very recent, until very recently, um, a student in interactive media. And um, I'm personally very interested in the kind of building of um, communication protocol and understanding how that, how that um, structure, structures certain actions and enables certain actions to happen. Hello, my name is Alexandra, and uh, I'm also part of the X Message project together with Cliff. Um, I'm also engaged in um, media practice, and I recently become a mum, and that's changed a lot of things for me. So I'm still sort of in a transitional phase of breastfeeding my child and coming back into the real world. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at now. Um, my name's Tim Coser. I'm from the Benson Project at University College London. Oh, sorry, yes, that's a failing of mine. I also speak very quietly, which is a problem. Um, I'm from the Benson Project at University College London, and we are crowdsourcing the extensive manuscripts of Jeremy Bentham in the hope of speeding along our work. Um, I'm a historian by training, um, and my um, topic of interest is Australian colonial history, specifically the transportation of convicts to Australia. Um, well. Thank you very much. I decided I'm not going to tell you anything about the project because the authors and the, 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 the owners of the project are sitting here. And without wasting time, I would like to ask Philippe to move on to present um, his project, which had the golden knicker. And probably we would like to give him a big hand for that golden knicker, but because this project is a very innovative project, as you will hear. And applause for, for uh, Philippe, please. No? Okay, now we're live. Um, so, hello again. My name is Felipe Hoiser. Um, I'd like to say hello as well to my Chilean team who is actually watching this live stream. And the Golden Nika is, is actually because of them. I, I feel pretty much guilty because of the pictures holding the Golden Nika when it's really about them who are able to, to build this great project that, that I lead called Ciudad Inteligente or, or, or Smart Citizen Foundation. Um, so thankfully, we won the, the Golden Nika this year. And I want to share with you our, our logo. If, if you see it very carefully, um, something happened actually just a day ago after we won the Golden Nika. And we're a bit happier right now because of that. And, and so we're a happy team sharing with you um, this particular conversation about digital communities. You can follow us in, at Twitter at at Vot Inteligente, or personally at, at F. Hoysen. Um, Ars Electronica is a great scenario to talk about uh, digital communities. And it's because of a symbiosis. You know, Ars Electronica is a symbiosis. Uh, understanding symbiosis as a close and often long-term interaction between two different species. And here, of course, we're talking about two different species of art and technology that communicate between each other and in some ways improves um, each other thanks to their particular background. You know, the imagination of the art and the structure and the method of science. Um, for this case, we can talk about this, uh, similar symbiosis for this panel, digital communities. You know, you have what's digital on the one side, technology, right, the internet, and on the other side you have communities. 
Other people talk about civic hackers, right? Citizenship on the one side of the symbiosis, and the other side you have uh, hacking, you know, technology, using of the web applications, and so on. So the background question behind this panel is what kind of relationship it, is this, right? And behind that big question, you also have lots of different questions, which are not able to address in just a couple of minutes, but things like, can web technology protect uh, uh, the public interest? Can web technology change politics? Can it start a revolution, as we saw at the previous panel? Can it kill a revolution, as, as people have uh, also addressed? Evgeny Morozov has, has some work about that as well. And more generally, has technology the ability to improve our lives? Um, I think without being a, a cliche, I think that the big answer to that question is a big no. Uh, and that no also was mentioned by Lena in the, in the previous panel when she said that the role of the internet and social networks has been pretty much exaggerated. Uh, this is not a, a, a Facebook revolution, it's a, it's a street revolution, right? It's about real people having real problems. Um, Similarly, in Chile, we have faced this year, 2011, a great revolution from the students. Uh, this is the march of the, of the umbrellas. Uh, we gathered that day under, it was very cold, it actually snowed that morning in Santiago, which, which doesn't happen. Uh, and we gathered that day because, not because of the web, not because of the internet, we gathered because of there was something happening to our lives. You know, the issues you discuss with your family at dinner, those are the, the, the issues that gather you. Issues like education, about losing a job, about the price of food, about not having the ability to exercise your rights. Those are the, the issues, those, those are the reasons why you gather. And that's why people can, can support different causes. It's not the web, it's not technology in itself. Uh, of course, Technology can also be a great tool, right? And, and David Sasaki mentioned as well that uh, internet was for 2011 the same thing that the TV was for the US movements of 1968. Uh, I strongly believe that, and this is a great example of how the web can change things. And it's a very creative thing as well. In the case of Chile, it, it was a, more of a middle class revolution. I wanna address that issue a, a bit. Uh, there's a blog, someone said, you know, education in Chile has died. Uh, so we are all zombies of education, and we want to protest in front of the presidential palace. And this guy wrote a blog, make an invitation to everyone gather and dance thriller in front of the presidential palace as a protest. And he made, with his friends, a YouTube video of a tutorial of how to dance thriller, right? And he posted uh, on Facebook, people gathered, and this is the result. I deeply admire these people. They, they are great. Uh, students have been very creative in their way of protesting. And, and of course, I mean, the, the technology and the web had a pretty good, uh, important role to play in gathering these people. But at the end, they were there dancing thriller and, and you know, trying their steps hours earlier because of education, because they wanted to have a better kind of education, a more accessible one. So again, the focus should be on the tools. Uh, and you can use technology as a good tool to defend yourself sometimes from the police. Uh, but you could also use technology for something else and to gather for not that good purposes, right? And which actually happened as well in Chile. Uh, and yesterday, for those who were here and, and had the chance to hear Humberto Maturana, who is a great uh, bi biologist and, and philosopher in, in Chile, um, he invited us to, to, to look at the process of understanding things, but not just focusing on the objects, but actually on the process of learning. So the process of learning is gonna be different according to different people who want to understand things. Uh, similarly, I think that we have put so much attention on this particular object uh, of, of the internet, of the tool, the applications, the ability to gather data and so on, but not to focus on the hand who actually holds it. 
So it's the same issue. This is about real human people. And strong technology can really do strong things on the political world if it is properly embedded in social life. And this is what we want to do, what we try to do at Ciudadana Inteligente. I just want to showcase briefly some of our main projects. This is the Citizen Balloon project. It's based uh, on a great work done by folks at, at the MIT. Um, Jeff Warren and his team has done balloon mapping, and we borrowed the same idea using a, a recycled bottle to build a, 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 some kind of an aircraft and put a, a camera, uh, not a camera actually, it's an iPhone or an Android with streaming ability, and we uh, attached it. Okay, so, so we attached that iPhone to a balloon uh, with the aim to stream what was happening on the protests. Um, the, so we want to show what was happening on the protests, which was not actually being shown by real television. So we want to show with technology, very simply, uh, what was going on. And the iPhone was a great tool to do that. You know, we, we fit, got that iPhone to an helium balloon and lifted up about 30 to 50 meters high to show from an alternative, alternative perspective what was happening on those protests. And those are some of the images you can get. It was all about a, a peaceful movement and not about throwing stones and the stuff that actually the, the television was showing at that time. Uh, I just have a couple of minutes, so I want to showcase as well other projects we develop at Ciudad Inteligente. Uh, we are a web platform that holds several other tools. Just show uh, the, the, the main ones. Bot Inteligente was our first tool and allows us through the web to monitor what Congress does. You can find every single bill online. And we scrap the data from the Congress website and we visualize it in a very didactic way. You can understand how your congressman votes, uh, what is the funding that those congressmen have, you can understand basically how legislation works. And it's a great tool then for NGOs, again, for digital communities. It's about reducing information asymmetries. You give them information that allows them to do what they do best. You give this information to an, an environmentalist NGO, they can protect uh, the environment, you know, dial uh, having a dialogue with Congress now because they have new information. They know about the law, they know who votes it, they know who is in favor of it, they know who have against it, thanks to these kinds of tools. Um, another relevant tool we have built, uh, I have to just run, uh, this is called 21 de Mayo, and it's basically a visualization of data about uh, how the president has accomplished or not his commitments that he has made to be the president. And you can show by nice visualizations what is actually happening, right? If, if policy is being delivered or not. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects. It's called the Inspector of Interests. Uh, we built a database with the declarations of congressmen about uh, their assets and interests. We found that information was not very complete. So we built this website gathering other sources of data coming from the public register, from the tax and revenue service, and we visualize what are the real interests that these members of parliament have. And you can actually see it. You know, this person, for example, this senator, has only declared half of what he actually has. And this is important in terms of when you do legislation. You can also visualize the areas of interest where he has those interests. And thanks to Vote Inteligente, we can cross-reference that with legislation itself, so you can find interest associations between assets and the way you do policy. Uh, smart access or access intelligent is another tool we built which allows you to make freedom of information requests based on FOI law uh, online from a single window and a one-stop shop. You can ask questions to the government and all the answers to those questions again can be published online and a data, uh, in a database that, that is publicly searchable. So basically, before you ask a new question, you would like to search the database and see if someone else might have asked that question before you. And so it's more efficient in the long term, even for the government, who will not, not have to reply two times for the same issue. Um, other visualizations like this one, it, it, it shows you where all the antennas of the different mobile phone companies are. Some of them are, are actually are put there illegally, and you have the right to know where's the closest antenna to, to you. And finally, regarding the, 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 the student movement, we did a nice 
visualization as well about the conflict. On the left side, you found the proposals coming from the stu uh, students. On the right side, the proposals coming from the government. And you can see where are they getting close or where they are far away. This allows citizens to understand the social movement, to understand where's the conflict, of course, understand where's the solution. So just a final thought, knowing that, that the time has, has ended. Um, just want to stress the idea that was also stressed in the previous panel by Sineb uh, Tufeci about collective action. I think that at the end, technology, web technology, is about collective action. Uh, she said this is about shared problems that would be effectively solved by mass participation. Um, again, social problems are the same ones that we have had for several years. Uh, this generation, the past generation, and so on. Technology is making something different, and it allows us to gather to uh, create causes and to share those causes very easily, very uh, quickly, in a way that wasn't uh, possible before. Uh, so just to say that, that at the end, I think that these kind of tools we have created, some of the ones we'll see now in a few minutes uh, uh, from, from other colleagues, they will have success if those great tools, those nice data visualizations, web applications, mobiles, and so on, will be great if they are greatly thought to be embedded in a real social context. That's when they will actually make sense. And just this time, to, to finish, Beatrice, just to share this, this second's video, which summarizes the whole idea of what our organization does. Okay, so that was it. Thank you very much. We're very glad to be here. We're very honored of winning the, the Golden Nika, as, as we mentioned in the gala. I think that we're very grateful about this particular mention, about this particular category of digital communities, because at the end, the web is about connecting real people, uh, real life, real problems, and that's what we want to do thanks to technology. Thanks to you all. And thanks to my team as well in Chile who is listening. A big applause to them because of winning this award. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe, for, the, for this wonderful presentation. I think that video at the end definitely summarizes what you do and uh, everyone can understand and uh, what the, the, the impact of your work is and uh, how important it is. We will be moving from Chile over to London for another presentation, which I think it's going to be very different from what you have done, but it's not less important. And I, will, I think we have a double presentation at this time. And may I just ask you to take the floor and to present the next project. Hi, I'm Cliff, this is Alexandra, and we're here to present our project, X Message. So what we're going to do is we're going to, going to go through some of the context the project was created in, how it works, and then Alexandra is going to talk about our methodology, about how the co-creation of software can be a research tool in itself to um, unpack and explore communication practices. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the structural politics of the system itself. So um, X message um, began as an attempt to understand the relationship between the structures of power embedded in software and the, the forces that act upon people working within the sex industry. And it came out of a context of a um, number of um, kind of cr critical media experiments and discussions that we conducted while we were studying at the Centre for Cultural Studies and Goldsmiths. And it's also situated within a kind of um, a wider practice 
of critical media projects, such as um, those conducted by Mongrel, and would like very much emphasise like previous work by um, John Demars, such as um, collaboratively putting together a website with um, Congolese immigrants and his um, project um, Free Mob, which was an attempt to set up small texting networks for sub-Saharan migrants. So our, our starting point was to investigate the um, restrictions and barriers that sex workers face um, in trying to organize. And what um, Zina was saying earlier about um, the, a collective action problem is really relevant here, because, because that's exactly what they face that you know, in, in trying to take part in activism, they risk exposure, and also they're subject to a number of, of commercial pressures, which keep them moving around, and it's hard to make connections. They're pitted as individual sellers, one against the other, and then there's a whole set of legal restrictions. For instance, it's not even legal for two sex workers to work together in the same flat, despite the obvious protection this affords them. And through this investigation, uh, we got into a dialogue with a group called um, Crosstalk. Uh, Crosstalk are a self-organized, sex worker-led group. They develop initiatives to improve working conditions in the sex industry. Uh, they provide uh, English language lessons to, um, to migrant sex workers, and they aim to establish political and support networks across the industry. With Crosstalk, we've been developing a system to support the coordination of activism and pedagogy, and to enable further sex worker-led communication initiatives. Um, so the system that we created is the social telephony software system. Um, it's a many-to-many -many text message server that's, uh, where the user is able to send uh, a text message to the whole network for the price of one. Um, the the system, system operates a DIY telephony server um, that uses a second-hand mobile phone and, uh, and a recycled computer. Um, the mobile phone is connected to the computer with a USB cable, and on the server, they're sitting a piece of software, software that we've written. It's a Perl script that fuses together open source telephony application Gnocchi and Gamma with the MySQL database um, that redirects and processes the text messages out to the network of users. Um, the system is designed to act according to existing communication practices within the sex industry. Um, to give a few examples of how that works or within the system, uh, is that the system respects the need for anonymity uh, by not requiring a username. It try to, tries to meet uh, the linguistic diversity within the sex industry by having the potential to operate at the moment with six different languages. Um, also, it kind of mirrors the informal and flexible um, communication practices within the industry, so you can instantly create a new network um, for, for the purpose you need by sending a text message to the server. Um, working on the text message project, we've been very much interested in developing a critical methodology um, to investigate the barriers that uh, hinders migrant women in having a voice and organizing within the sex industry. And Crosstalk has been extremely important for us to work with because we've, through them, learned a lot about the strategies that sex workers practice in order to maneuver around these barriers that they face in their everyday life. Um, and I think it's important to say that a key um, a key criteria for us is that our collaboration with Crosstalk uh, is a mutual knowledge exchange, um, not only on a practical level, but also if we try to think about the notion of exchange, maybe in a broader perspective, it opens up for um, it opens up for um, for understanding the system not only as a functional software solution, but also as a catalyst where um, as a catalyst that produces new connection between women, telephones, and software. And as you can see on the images, I've tried to highlight some, uh, or bring in one of, the, one of the ways we try to think about technology when we work with it. Because um, we do a lot of technical experiments, but we're really interested in trying uh, 
to see how we can investigate them by bringing up these historical repositories layered in the media of the objects themselves um, and try to understand them as containers for cultural narrative that refers to a very feminist practice of, of technology. Um, so I think creating these new uh, connections between women, phones, software, women, women and machine, women as machines, cyborgs and women and labor um, has somewhat correlated the subject we're working on on a deeper and definitely more speculative level. I'm just coming back to the practical level shortly. Uh, these questions and actions that have uh, brought our research further um, have often been born out of mere frustration work, trying to work with commercial services. For instance, um, it proved completely impossible to find a, text a commercial text message service that could deal with six different languages that we needed to meet the, like, also like the borders of the sex industry um, and the linguistic diversity. Um, so we always, we ended up obviously, as you can see, creating our own, uh, but also all these, um, all these research findings compiled a body that in itself exposes the limits of, of, um, of commercial technology and exposes the, the norms that are layered within them that, that tend to apply to a very specific uh, Western Anglo-American uh, technology practice. All right. Um, this space has, um, this space have, um, all these limitations realizing that have opened a new space um, for practical peer, -to peer support within the sex industry. Um, and I think Cliff wants to talk a bit more about the systems now. Yeah, yes. Um, I want to talk about the structural uh, politics of setting up a text message system through a rather in, impetuous juxtaposition. This is a diagram of um, CyberSign, which was a system created by um, Stafford Beer to um, regulate and coordinate the economic and political life of Chile in the 1970s. And it was attacked for being bizarrely, well, attacked for being um, authoritarian, but has a lot of um, democratic potential in it. If you see the kind of two arrows, they represent the kind of a process of reciprocal vetoing, where the bottom could veto the top as well as the top, as top could veto the bottom. Um, but you could just, um, the problem with it is you could just turn these features off. And that was, in a way, um, a problematic with X message as well. It was a de we designed it as a decentralized system, free from, free from surveillance, but you could just change the code. Um, code. So we've had to, we've, um, had to think very carefully because it's not been possible um, implementing, because we've implemented this system on existing communications infrastructure. We've gone for the um, pay-as-you-go mobile, which every sex worker has. And so we haven't been able to create some kind of ideal decentralized system. So we've had to think about where it's centered. And this is why we're working with Crosstalk uh, activist group, rather than a state organization or a charitable organization who might have another agenda. And the, uh, the other thing to say about it is not to be too deceived by diagrams. Um, this, this, this represents kind of our initial vision of the system with a, you know, a kind of large network between you know, great, a great many number of sex workers with everyone communicating to everyone at, at once. But when you think of the need for discretion, the linguistic diversity of the group, such a system is an imposition. So we've designed it differently to allow the production of diverse networks. And we're further designing new protocols to, um, to be employed in the different functions that this system could be put to, such as um, safety and coordinating activism. Yeah, and just to sum up, I um, wanted to say thank you very much for uh, letting us present our project here. We're very grateful to be here, and we also have to say thank you very much to our collaboration partners, Crosstalk, uh, who's a very big part of this project as well. Um, we hope that we've... Um, We've uh, touched some of the themes of today's debate, and, uh, and uh, we look forward to the forthcoming debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cliff and Alexandra, where you see the diversity of the project that were chosen uh, for this year's prize. We still have one more project to go, and this is, again, very different from the two projects that you've listened to. And now Tim has the floor and has 10 minutes.
to present the last project so that we have a couple of minutes more left for discussions. Thank you, Tim. Um, just like this, I'd just like to say thank you for, for having us here. Um, the Digital Communities Jury for recognising the project and for everybody for, for coming along to, to hear us. It's very much appreciated. Um, Transcribe Bentham, um, a project hosted by the Bentham Project at University College London, is a pioneering crowdsourced collaborative manuscript transcription project. Um, and as such, I'd like to publicly thank and acknowledge everybody who's collaborated on it and contributed to its success. Uh, like Felipe, there's a little bit of guilt on my part that I'm the only one here when so many people have been involved. Um, these include Professor Philip Schofield, the director of the project, my two highly talented fellow research associates, Valerie Wallace and Justin Tonra, Martin Moyle of UCL Library Services, Tony Slade of UCL Learning and Media Services, Richard Davis of the University of London Computer Centre who put together this transcription tool which I'll talk about more in more detail in a moment. Uh, Dr Melissa Terrace of UCL's Centre for the Digital Humanities who's provided valuable consultation. And most importantly, the volunteers who have given their time and effort in uh, taking part and making the project such a success. Transcribe Bentham uh, makes available the manuscript writings of the hugely influential philosopher and reformer Jeremy Bentham who was born in 1748 and died in 1832. Uh, these manuscripts are held in UCL special collections and they're among the college's most valuable holdings. Uh, Bentham was a prodigious writer. Uh, the collection runs to 60,000 manuscript folios uh, or an estimated 15 million words. The British Library holds a further 15,000 folios or another 4 million words. Um, Bentham is a figure of outstanding historical importance and philosophical um, significance and contemporary significance in uh, intellectual life. And he wrote on a wide range of topics, including penal reform, codification, censorship, economics, secularism, religion, and um, by way of a very brief digression um, relating to this morning's discussion, he even began composing a uh, constitution for Tripoli. Uh, during late 1822, he became briefly embroiled in a uh, nebulous conspiracy to overthrow the Pasha of Tripoli um, by concocting a, a plan with the Tripolitan Hassan de Guise. They intended to approach the Pasha and to persuade him to introduce a constitution written by Bentham. If he refused, then they would resort to armed insurrection. Um, and Bentham, would be, Bentham uh, would be drafting the Constitution, and he also drafted a letter to John Quincy Adams, then Secretary of State, uh, US Secretary of State, to solicit military and moral support. And Bentham thought that once the revolution in Tripoli had succeeded, it would then spread to Tunis, Algiers, Morocco, and eventually Egypt. And there's no evidence this letter was actually sent, but and Bentham's attention soon switched to writing the Constitution for Greece. Bentham is perhaps best known for three things. Uh, firstly, for being the founder of the modern doctrine of utilitarianism, the idea that um, the legislator should act uh, in, with the greatest happiness of the greatest number in mind. Secondly, for his proposed panoptican prison, in which prisoners believe, would believe themselves to be constantly under surveillance and therefore modify their behavior in order to avoid punishment. And thirdly, uh, for his auto-icon. Um, according to the terms of his will, Bentham wished to be publicly dissected uh, and his body and head preserved, and his remains dressed and put on public display. The, the auto icon was donated to UCL in 1850, and where he sits um, in his clothes, in his chair, and he remains an object of fascination to students and visitors alike, even today. So at UCL, then, we are the custodians both of Bentham's corpse and his corpus. Um, the aim of the Bentham Project, uh, founded in 1959, is to, and now part of UCL's Faculty of Laws, is to produce the new authoritative edition of uh, the collected works of Jeremy Bentham. To date, 28 of 70 volumes have been produced. Then the volumes are, to a great extent, based on these manuscripts. And the editors thus need to identify all of the relevant images, transcribe them, and so they can edit it into a coherent text. Transcription is a hugely time-consuming and expensive process, and thus far, staff have transcribed about 20,000 folios during the past 50 years. And much work clearly remains to be done. Um, and to put it another way, the Bentham Papers are a resource of outstanding historical and philosophical importance. And yet much of the content, far from being even vaguely known, has, uh, has hardly been adequately studied. 
To help put this right, uh, speed matters long, democratise our work and widen access to this priceless collection, we launched Transcribe Bentham under funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in September 2010. Excuse me. Crowdsourcing is a, uh, an increasingly popular tool for researchers to engage the interested general public and to, to get research done. Um, you might well be familiar with established projects such as the uh, Citizen Science Zooniverse, which includes Galaxy Zoo, um, the National Library of Australia's historic newspaper collection, and the recently launched Dickens Journals Online. Each of these is a, a, a project which um, involves the public at the very heart of what it does. Many are attracted to crowdsourcing for the supposed promise of getting tasks done more quickly and cheaper, though often expensive infrastructure uh, needs to be created. But of equal importance is engaging a community with a collection so that it becomes widely used rather than remaining in an archive out of general public access. Transcribe Bentham is built on mutual trust between us and the volunteers. Um, anyone anywhere in the world with an internet connection can volunteer and participants need no prior background knowledge or expertise as we provide um, extensive instructions. Volunteers access and transcribe manuscripts through our transcription desk, which is a customised media wiki with an inbuilt transcription tool, social media functions such as user profiles and a discussion forum and, and rudimentary gaming mechanics which include a point system and a leaderboard to encourage friendly competition. We also ask volunteers to encode their transcripts in, transcripts in text encoding initiative compliant XML, which is a non-proprietary format ensuring the long-term uh, interoperability of the transcripts. Submissions are moderated by Transcribe Bentham staff and completed transcripts are later uploaded to UCL Library's digital Bentham repository, which will ultimately contain the entire collection when it's digitized. So Transcribe Bentham volunteers are thus contributing to the production of humanities research rather than merely acting as the consumers of it. And their transcripts will also form the basis of the collected works of Jeremy Bentham and ensure that the digital repository is an increasingly rich resource for future researchers. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the task involved, as you can see, clearly looks quite complex. Um, manuscripts can be up to a couple of thousands of word long. They're complicated by Bentham's often terrible handwriting. That's not a particularly bad example. Um, frequent deletions, interlineal additions, and marginalia. And yet, despite this, the results have been fairly impressive. At the last count, we have 1,350 registered users, and these have transcribed over 1,700 manuscripts. Um, that's an estimated 450,000 words. Um, one volunteer has transcribed more than 750 manuscripts alone, and another has transcribed more than 225. Um, the site's received visits from 106 countries, with primarily Britain, Europe, and North America, but also as far uh, as Egypt, Australia, Peru, and the Philippines. Um, I realize time is running out here. So um, just to say that the project has been uh, quite prominent in the field. It's featured in numerous blogs, conference discussions, and in the media, including a feature article in the New York Times last Christmas, uh, which gave the project uh, great impetus. The transcription desk has been used in university classes in Britain and the United States, and the code for the, the tool and the, 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 so they meet the code for the uh, customized media wiki is now um, available on an open source basis for people to, to use for their own collections. Um, the funding under which we were established was for 12 months and ceased at the end of April, so we're now um, seeking new uh, avenues of funding to expand the project and keep it going. Um, just to say in conclusion that Transcribe Bentham is something that Bentham would have approved of greatly. He was always a fan of uh, innovation and uh, new things. And furthermore, in a pamphlet he wrote entitled Auto Icon or the Father Uses of the Dead to the Living, uh, he requested that his manuscripts be publicly, ex publicly displayed um, alongside his preserved body after his death. Conceive, he wrote, the old philosopher preserved in some safe repository, accompaniments of it his unedited and unfinished manuscripts lodged in an appropriate case of shelves. In this far-famed receptacle, there would be no want of matter of wonder and admiration. And thanks to the community of volunteers taking part in Transcribe Bentham, uh, we're helping to honour his final wish. And thank you again for the award and for coming today. Thank you. also for taking account the time factor. Well, we have, just more, we have got just 10 more minutes left, and I have this very 
uh, uncomfortable job to say that. We will just take a few questions. Um, may I just ask you to keep your questions very short and indicate to, who, to whom you're posing your question. And uh, I will just ask you also to keep your answers very short. We will take about five questions and then uh, round it up with the answers from our uh, speakers. Does anybody want to start? Any questions? Uh, I have a question to Felipe. Uh, I wonder if you experienced any problems uh, caused by politicians who, who discovered that um, you actually open um, you know, the question if they are uh, actually uh, doing their work properly. I mean, this uh, you know you, you shown this uh, this uh, uh, system uh, showing people that uh, actually they are not. Uh, you know, they are just promising and not not doing what they said. So this may be a bit problematic for uh, politicians from different parties. Okay. Did you have a question, Philippa? Yeah. Good. Any other question? Question. Hi, also a question on uh, Felipe. Uh, your uh, program, uh, um, the same program uh, that the lady asked about, is it, is it platform based? Is it something that you can simply sort of uh, take out of a Chilean context and put it into another country context and their politicians and uh, kind of a, uh, uh, plug it into their uh, political system? Thank you very much. Now the final chance for a question, for a last question. If there, is no, if there are no other questions, I will give the floor to Philippe. Uh, but I also will ask uh, Tim, uh, Alexandra, and Cliff to have some final words. If there is some other thing that you would like to say about the work that you're doing, could be how you see the future of this work. What, what is going to happen with your project? What are the next steps that you plan to take? And, uh, how, I think the question of funding was also raised. You may want to uh, say a few words about that, just to finish. Okay, um, thank you very much for, for the questions. Um, the first one about the problems, I, I would just frame it a bit wider as well. Um, I think coming from a, a, a developing country, we face several constraints. Um, of course, uh, well, we have, you mentioned the political constraints, but we also face technical constraints. You know, sometimes we gather in, in, in different meetings and we, we, we complain because we don't have access to information, we don't have enough data. Well, this happens in, 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 in Europe, this happens in the US. I mean, imagine what, how it happens in Chile uh, and the rest of Latin American countries. We, we of course, don't have enough data. Uh, if it's not easily to scrap it. Uh, but again, it's possible to do something. You just need to, again, adapt to your context to do what you want to do. Um, so we face technical constraints, and of course we also face political constraints. I think that, that um, from a policy background, I mean, politics is about power, finally. It's about controlling, it's about controlling information as well. So if you want to challenge that idea, challenge that control, you might face political problems as well. Uh, but again, the idea about how to embed that into real life is extremely important. Because if you just, you know, have an online database where you highlight, uh, uh, I don't know, column X with, um, I don't know, column Y, whatever, uh, and there's an important piece of information, that will not make sense if there's not real people that get, their, get that information, do something about it. In our case, coming from a context where access to the internet is highly unequal, uh, the press has an incredible role to play to get this information, say something about it, tell a story about it, so people can read on the newspapers, on the metro, on the radio, TV, and so on. And, and the other big role uh, is, uh, is, is coming from, from, um, 
from NGOs. I mean, NGOs have, uh, with information, basically can improve the things that they normally do. If you have real actors, real digital communities using this technology, then you can face those political constraints that normally exist. And do you want me to answer the, the second question as well? Just very shortly, because we still have to go. Yeah, very shortly, the, 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 the websites and the applications we built are all open source, are, are all available in GitHub. If you want to look at them, a technical perspective, they are in PHP, JavaScript, and using uh, Google as a framework, GWT. Um, and some are of our, actually, we're now having our first tool that it's not only deployable, but it's actually, you just plug it. Uh, and, and we will see Vot Inteligente, the one I mentioned, now being deployed in Argentina for their national election, which is happening next month with a more kind of a user-friendly interface. But everything is, is open. I think that's the main rule about the web, and we, we, we really try to respect that. Thank you very much. Cliff, will you have a minute? Have a minute so that we'll finish up on time. OK. This is, OK. Um, well, I, I think one of the next steps we're going to be, be doing is that we, I mean, we think there's um, a lot of potential for different functions. Uh, in the X message system, in, in, in the context of sex work activism, uh, for instance, um, transmitting date, transmitting information and warnings on on dangerous clients, giving general safety information, creating social and advice networks, and, and allowing different and diverse forms of activism. But what we've discovered is that e each one of these needs their own kind of communication protocol that's specific and bespoke to that. So we're going to be trying to get that running on on you know, this one single system. And the other thing is to try it, we're gonna be looking at trying to make the system itself more accessible, more so any, any, any one person can set, can set it up, hopefully without too much technical knowledge. So if there are other contexts that this system can be used in, then it will be easy to deploy. Um, do you want to say? Maybe I'll just say something very shortly referring to the debate of today. There's been a lot of focus on online communities and our system is actually an offline system. Um, and I think like um, what we're trying to, under try to understand uh, that maybe some of the more uh, um, like some of the uh, like some of the communities that can't access or will not access internet use for for different uh, reasons might be able to or might benefit from operating on offline systems instead that are more local. Thank you. Um, we, uh, as I... <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Um, as I sort of hinted at the the end of the. the Project there, we, we only had a very short time frame to to launch the project. We um, to add the 12-month period and limited funding to get it going. And there's the potential to achieve a lot more. Um, the we we plan to digitise the entire collection, as well as the collection of the British Library, and reunite this for the first time since Bentham's death. Um, as well as improving the transcription interface to sort of increase the the rate of user. Um, recruitment and retention because we know it's a lot of people register for the project and don't necessarily do anything because as you saw it wasn't a necessarily um, user-friendly interface there so if we can introduce a, you know, what you see is what you get transcription tool that would be a lot more helpful and we'd also I'd like to add a lot of editorial content to the repository and create a, an enduring historical resource but the funding situation is extremely competitive especially in the humanities um, we applied for a, a grant uh, last month the scheme is going to support between six and nine uh, projects and there were 68 applications so it's going to be interesting to see how we do there but we remain hopeful and, uh, well we should good luck uh tim and the rest of the project i'm sorry we had not much time to discuss about this very interesting project but i think uh you're all still here and if anyone wants to find out about about more about your project, you can always contact him, you can contact Alexander Cliff or Felipe. And I want to say thank you to Ars Electronica for having provided a space for us to get to know this project. And I wish you a great day and a great festival. Thank you very much.